I have sat through eight miserable, boring hours of Rings of Power, ranging in quality from the most debased levels of cringe-inducing garbage to somewhat watchable but ultimately always disappointing junk-grade imitation Tolkien. This show is an insult to Tolkien and a $1 billion middle finger to the fandom. Now, Rings of Power is complete trash. You know that, I know that, Amazon knows that. We can disagree on just how bad it is, but not on its fundamental awfulness. You don't need me to tell you that Rings of Power is a piece of shit. The question is not, is this bad? The question now is, why? Why is this so bad? How do you make something so soul-crushingly awful from the world and author that gave us Lord of the Rings? This should not have been hard. Hire the best people, stick to the lore, follow the Mandalorian model of keeping the woke maniacs away from the project, give an experienced, competent crew the time and money they need, and it's basically a guaranteed home run. But no, because... Progression. Yes, black female dwarves are now much more important than a compelling story or an ethnographically coherent world. Thank God the Lord of the Rings trilogy was made in the late 90s and not in current era. If it was made today, it wouldn't stand a hobbit's chance at Helm's Deep. So in this video, I'm going to be comparing current year Rings of Power with the true Lord of the Rings trilogy, focusing on the most important categories, and in doing so, hopefully we can come to an understanding of where this show went so wrong and why it is as bad as it is. So break out the man flesh and grog, boys, because this is going to be a long one. We'll start with characters. Let's take a look at how Elrond is presented in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The movie wastes no time in building his character. The opening battle scene from Fellowship immediately communicates several important things about him. A huge army of orcs are charging at him, arrows are flying past him on both sides, inches from his face. The outcome of this battle will determine the fate of Middle-earth and the very existence of his people, and he's stone cold. He's in control, giving orders, doing his fucking duty. Elrond is in command here, in command of himself and his army. When the narration tells us, Victory was near. We're unsurprised, because the quality of leadership displayed by Elrond in those brief seconds is the kind of generalship that wins battles, and we know that instinctively. We don't need someone to say something like, Look at you now. Commander of the Northern Armies. Warrior of the Wastelands. We see that Elrond is a great general in these few seconds because the director is actually good and he knows that in a good movie, show, don't tell. In seconds, Lord of the Rings has shown us that Elrond is a brave, experienced, highly skilled officer and a good leader. Now let's look at how Elrond is presented by Amazon. Mr. Sandman. Bring me a dream. I actually laughed when I saw that scene. He's covered in makeup, sitting in a tree like a 19th century boarding school girl. This is like something out of a Jane Austen novel. I'm half expecting a teenage girl to run up to him and give him some exciting news about an upcoming social event. Darling Elrond, have you heard? Mummy is going to be throwing a ball this coming March. I just said so. I know that wokeism demands that previously masculine men be emasculated and presented as weak and emotional. There was this one customer that came to me. He wanted to have solid colored drapes in a little girl's room. I said, don't do it. You need butterflies, polka dots, balloons. But this is just ripping the piss. And for the purposes of distinguishing the real Elrond from the Jane Austen Elrond, I shall be referring to the latter as El, short for the hipper, more bohemian Elrond, spelt E-L-L-E -L -L -E and spoken with French pronunciation. Not only must L be depicted as an effete dandy, he must be shown to be the inferior of the show's lead character and unintended villain, Galadriel, who I shall refer to using the now well-established standard Guy Ladriel, since she bears no resemblance whatsoever to the Tolkien character Galadriel. Just in case the audience forgets that Elrond isn't Elrond anymore, but is now L, Amazon decides to remind us with this exchange. You have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. L has only been on screen a few minutes and already he's a boarding school girl and has lost a dick measuring contest to a woman. The deconstruction of Elrond gets worse when L is introduced to the guy from the shampoo ad. So long, the way L looks at him, I was honestly half expecting him to walk up to the guy and get laid into him there and then.
It's like the writers thought, fuck it, we've already turned Sam, Frodo, and Aragorn into women and turned Middle Earth into the USA, a white majority with a black minority. We might as well just go full broke back and have a couple of male elves fuck on camera. We cannot do this. It is not the elven way. Shut up and fuck me. Moving on now to Sauron, I actually love Sauron in Rings of Power because he's a fucking hero. The orcs are defeated, the war is lost, and the orcs are expelled into the wastelands, and what does Sauron do? Does he go full Frenchman and start forging weapons for the new conquerors and maybe serve them tea and biscuits on their days off when they're taking a break from fucking his daughter? No. He goes full de Gaulle and leads the orcs in defeat, choosing a hunted exile in the wastelands rather than collaboration with the new conquerors and the betrayal of his defeated master's legacy. No, he stays loyal to the memory of Morgoth and chooses responsibility for the defeated orcs he sided with. He chooses suffering and duty over surrender and comfort. This guy is Robert the Bruce. He's Ho Chi Minh. He's Sitting Bull. He's Moses. He's a hero. The showrunners want us to view him as the bad guy, but have completely failed to establish his villainy. Why exactly am I rooting against him again? Because he's being hunted by this psychopath? Who spent the last two centuries pursuing him in an eternal journey of vengeance and blood? Because he lost a war? Have a look at this scene, and credit to the CGI guys that made this because it is beautiful. Could you imagine a more heroic looking figure than Sauron in this scene? Look at him! He stands as a beacon of hope for the last of a defeated people. In Lord of the Rings, he is a conqueror, launching a war of aggression and extermination against the world of men. In the very first scene, we see him in all his awesome might, trying to smash an entire army that stands in the way of his final victory, his total conquest and subjugation of Middle-earth. But in Rings of Power, Sauron is a sympathetic figure because he resists the fanatically bloodthirsty Galadriel. Amazon assumed we would root against Sauron and for Galadriel because that's how it was in the trilogy, but they have failed to establish their respective moral positions from which we come to this understanding. It's also worth noting that Sauron is the only man in this show worth looking up to. In his not-Sauron form, Halbrand, he's level-headed, diplomatic, intelligent, skilled, aggressive, brave, and violent when he needs to be. The only male character in this show who you would look at and think capable of making both love and war is Halbrand, soon to be Sauron the Great. Because in the minds of the showrunners and of the woke in general, assertiveness, masculinity, confidence, and the capacity for violence are all negative traits. But of course, only for men. All of these traits are to be admired in a woman. So it only makes sense that the man who will eventually turn out to be Sauron possesses these inherently masculine traits. This is another example of the writer's utter incompetence leading to the audience viewing a character opposite to how the writers wanted the audience to view him. Why wouldn't you look up to such a leader as Sauron? He's the only real man in the show. Now that we have seen how Amazon unintentionally inverted the hero-villain roles, let's look at some gender-swapped roles, Sam and Frodo. In Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo are on a mission to save Middle-earth from Sauron's basically inevitable conquest of it. They are constantly moving, fleeing, literally on the run for their lives from the second Frodo gets the ring until they arrive almost dead from hunger, thirst, and exhaustion on the slopes of Mount Doom. It is a truly epic odyssey, one of the most magnificent hero's journey stories in the Western canon. In Rings of Power, Sam and Frodo are two aimless women, hanging around, doing glorified fuck all, and oh look, some guy fell out of the sky, let's have them spend an hour trying to communicate with him. Fucking riveting. To avoid confusion, I will henceforth be referring to female Sam and Frodo as Frodelma and Samiz. Frodelma and Samiz have one main function in this show, brand recognition. When a consumer buys a can of Coca-Cola, they expect a red can with wavy lettering. And when a consumer watches a Lord of the Rings product, which is how Amazon views Rings of Power, that consumer expects to see hobbits, which is why the Harfoots are in this show in the first place. And the main hobbits of Rings of Power should have roles that are recognizable from the movies. 
Frodalma plays the role of Frodo. She is the assertive leader of the duo. Samiz plays Sam. She is the follower and is expected to handle the more physical tasks and follow Frodelma's lead. Notice also the similarities in appearance. Frodelma, like Frodo, is slight, while Samiz, like Sam, is much meatier and more capable of hard physical labor. Another major difference from the OG Sam and Frodo is that Frodelma and Samiz have a largely egalitarian relationship in terms of their socioeconomic status. In Lord of the Rings, Frodo is a wealthy hobbit from a family that is quite high in social status. Sam is a working man, and given that he is of lower birth and socioeconomic condition than Frodo, he pays Frodo due deference and calls him Mr. Frodo. And Frodo expects this deference, not because he's a snob or anything, but because that's the way things are in hobbit society, a profoundly conservative society, and they have no cause to behave otherwise nor would it occur to them to do so, since Marxist agitation and class warfare isn't a thing in Hobbit society. Bear in mind that Sam and Frodo are fighting to preserve Middle-earth, they are fighting for the Shire, they don't want it to be turned into an industrial wasteland, they don't want Sauron conquering it and offering Jeff Bezos a tax incentive so Amazon can come in, flatten the place, burn it, yeah. and build an Amazon warehouse on the scorched earth and then pay the Hobbit staff minimum wage, minus fines for toilet breaks lasting more than 90 seconds. Sam and Frodo are not interlopers in someone else's war. This is their war. They are heroic warriors fighting for a cause they believe in, and which no one asked them to fight for. They drive the plot forward and give urgency to the narrative. In Rings of Power, however, the relationship between Frodelma and Samiz is not based on social hierarchy, since the potato hobbits don't have one or much of anything resembling a politically developed system of social organization. So the interesting social dynamic between Sam and Frodo has been sterilized, making Frodelma and Samiz a far less compelling screen duo. But the biggest problem with Frodelma and Samiz is that they are just boring. They plod around, filling time with mechanical tasks and whimsical activities. They eat berries, they talk meaningless shit, they run around. When they find a hobo that falls out of the sky, you think, wow, this might be about to get interesting, but no. They actually become even more boring because now there are these long, drawn-out scenes in which Frodelma tries to communicate with the sky hobo and figure out what he wants. These scenes literally almost put me to sleep. I'm not kidding. When I was watching this, I was slowly falling asleep. I had to give up on almost every episode I tried to watch and go to bed before I'd finished watching it because it was just exhausting to watch. I honestly think, and I'm not kidding, that after Rings of Power is cancelled and the dust has settled in the aftermath of this titanic disaster, Rings of Power will have a second life as ASMR clips on YouTube. There. And we don't know where that goes. It doesn't matter at this point. Because this shit would put an insomniac on ecstasy to sleep. Moving on now to the man-elf relationship. In Lord of the Rings, there is the eternally beautiful love story of Aragorn and Erwin, an immortal elf whose love for this man is so profound that she is willing to enter the mortal realm, watch him age and die before her as she remains young and beautiful, and live on a broken-hearted widow. Aragorn too knows this and is willing to let the love of his life go if it means that she will not have to endure the pain of his aging and death. It's one of the great screen romances. The Rings of Power Elf on Man subplot features a black elf and a village wench, who for the remainder of this video shall be referred to as Village Wench. The black elf is being referred to by many on YouTube as Don Lemonlass, but I'm just going to call him what he is. Say it! Say it! Stand-in Legolas. He is a stand-in for Legolas. Again, brand recognition of the on-screen product being the main purpose of his being there. The love story between stand-in and village wench is stale, boring, unexplained, and unrelated to the plot. On the contrary, it serves as a plot trough. Whenever these two meet, they just talk meaningless shit for a while, slowing down the story and amping up the already intense level of boredom that this abomination of a TV series inflicts upon its victims. And apart from anything else, why is Stand-In Legolas with her? He's an educated, refined, experienced soldier and a good-looking guy. He's a conqueror from a high civilization, serving as an occupying soldier in a land of mud and shit. Village Wench is a peasant product of that land, a middle-aged, single mother who spends her time cleaning animal filth and performing the menial tasks necessary to scrape by. Look... I know it gets lonely up in the watchtower, but I do get the sense that Standin has sold himself at well below market price here. Erwin might have entered a doomed relationship with a mortal man, but at least she went for a king. Now I ain't she a gold but Standin? 
The man's let himself down. He has settled for damaged goods scraped from the bottom of the barrel. Before I move on from Village Wench, I just need to talk briefly about her son's acting. This wee guy is just abysmal. What's one of them doing here? What are you so bothered about? It isn't your fault. Yes, it is. I gave power to the enemy, so that makes me responsible. You're wrong. It isn't your fault, it's mine. You don't understand. It's not just guilt, I feel. It's loss. I know none of us like to criticize kids when they're trying, but his acting is just hard to watch. It really is that bad. And there's no excuse here. If Game of Thrones could find Jack Gleason, who was amazing as Joffrey, Rings of Power should have been able to find a decent actor to play Village Wench's son. This is just incompetent casting, but the casting in this show is awful in general, so I suppose it fits the pattern at least. Let's now compare the Cave Troll battles. We'll start with Lord of the Rings. The Cave Troll battle in Fellowship of the Rings has become one of the classic battles of cinema history. It's legend level good, and the troll doesn't just burst onto the scene. The troll battle is built up beforehand. Boromir sees the troll approach and says, They have a cave troll. So now the tension is building. We know this fierce war creature that everyone is clearly very worried about is on its way. The battle with the goblins starts. There's some fighting. The tension builds up. And then the troll bursts into the room, screams and goes apeshit. Just brilliant. Like a great composer building up the orchestra to a beautiful, sweeping, dramatic gesture. The fight with the troll hasn't even started yet, and it's already amazing. The quality of the fight speaks for itself. I won't attempt to describe this epic of cinematic combat with mere words. You've all seen it. It's beautiful. It takes the combined efforts of the entire fellowship, including the hobbits, several minutes to kill the troll. During the fight, everyone in the fellowship is injured except Legolas, and Frodo is almost killed. This is a very hard-won victory against an extremely dangerous and brutal enemy that has been tortured to insanity. And that's the subtext of this cave troll fight that you wouldn't pick up on as a kid. This wretched beast is a slave. It's been brutalized its entire life, driven mad and used as a beast of burden and war. You really hear this misery in its final pitiful moan as the creature is finally put out of its misery. The director is subtle enough to allow this creature a final moment to show that it too was wronged. The chains that it uses as weapons are also the chains that have been used to enslave it. Now the Rings of Power cave troll fight. It takes Galadriel 15 seconds to defeat this cave troll. It took the Witch King longer than that to defeat Frodo. She does in 15 seconds what took four experienced warriors, a wizard and four hobbits several minutes. How? because that's how awesome she is. So first of all, there's no build up here as there is in Lord of the Rings. The troll literally just pops out of the ceiling, scurrying off one of Guy Ladriel's wimpy man soldiers. There's no real battle either. The troll throws a few soldiers around, then Guy Ladriel arrives and Mary sues it to death. She finishes the job with a brutal dagger to the head, just to show how brave she is. I'm not even going to call this a battle, this is just a slaughter. The slaughter doesn't even look good. It's too dark, there's lots of close-ups and flashy camera movements and cuts. The result is that the slaughter of the troll is the visual equivalent of an ugly dark blur. This show wants you to think of this slaughter of the troll as a great victory in the face of an attacking villain, but it isn't. It's the murder of a peaceful creature in its own home. In Lord of the Rings, the cave troll was led to the tomb to attack the Fellowship. They were defending themselves. The Fellowship didn't want any trouble. They just wanted to pass through Moria, not bother anybody, leave the goblins and whatever the hell else was down there to themselves and get the fuck out. Let us hope that our presence may go unnoticed. But Guy Ladriel went into that fortress looking for trouble. She entered in pursuit of Sauron, or maybe an orc that she might be able to disembowel for the crime of existing. She didn't have to enter the fortress, her men asked her to turn back, but she refused and invaded the cave troll's home. It? No. She. Let's give some dignity to this creature. She. In fact, let's give this cave troll a name. I understand. In death, a cave troll has a name. His name is Robert Paulson. 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 
His name is Robert Paulson. His name is Robert Paulson. Robert Paulson did absolutely nothing wrong. She was living in that fortress. Maybe she had a couple of cubs in there. You know, she's just trying to keep warm. It's freezing cold outside. And these bastards show up uninvited. How would you feel if you were trying to chill out on a Friday night and a group of armed soldiers walked through the door? You'd be fucking terrified. Robert Paulson's attack against the elves was a justified act of home defense. And while Lord of the Rings uses the last moment of their cave troll's life to show its value as a living, somewhat sentient creature, Rings of Power uses the last moment of Robert Paulson's life to show what a ruthless badass Galadriel is. And the bitch actually brags about murdering Robert Paulson later on. I half expected you to arrive caked in grime and mud. This time frostbite and troll blood. What a wanker, man. The next problem with Rings of Power is a big one, and one I first noticed when L and Shampooad go to Moria. Video game world movement. It's literally just like a video game. Whenever characters want to move, they load up the map screen, select their destination, some music plays, and they arrive. By the way, the elves arrived at Moria without horses. They fucking walked there. Let's put this into perspective. The distance from Rivendell to Khazad Doom is 175 miles, and these two just walk there. They arrive with no animals and no packs. Apparently, they don't need to eat or bed down at night. No, I'm not going to make another Brokeback Mountain joke. This same video game world movement occurs when Galadriel sails from Numenor to Middle Earth, and when the <laughs> are migrating after utterly desiccating the area they had previously infested. Lord of the Rings actually has a sense of in-world scale. This is what Sam and Frodo look like when they leave the Shire. This is what they look like shortly after escaping Mount Doom. We get a clear sense that they have covered a massive distance. It takes the Rohan army three days at top speed to get to Gondor. It takes Gandalf several days to find the Rohirrim and get them back to Helm's Deep before the uruk overrun it and kill the few warriors who remain alive from the battle. It took the Fellowship several days to get through Moria and they had to move fast because Saruman spies were everywhere and they were growing in number. And that's the other thing, time matters in Lord of the Rings. They are constantly against the clock. From the second Frodo gets the ring, it's all go. He has to flee the Nazgul, he doesn't have time to hang around pondering trees. Or discussing horses. It's not his pain that's bothering him. But that of his rider. Or bitching about the unfairness of life. Leave it to you to get kicked out of something you never earned in the first place. No. Or having a fucking rock breaking contest. Because he has important things to do. But Rings of Power, my god. There is zero sense of urgency in this show. This is one of the main reasons it is so boring. The characters seem to have all the time in the world on their hands. They never have to get things done. There's rarely a pressing issue or an approaching enemy, or a crisis to resolve, or an ally in need of immediate assistance. Everyone's just hanging around, looking very Tolkien-esque, or at least what Amazon believes should be Tolkien-esque. When Galadriel arrives at Rivendell, she has a few boring conversations with Elle, and does nothing of any import whatsoever. She never even needed to be there as far as the story is concerned. If a writer had told her on the road to Rivendell that the king has ordered that she return to Valinor immediately, nothing would have been lost except some very long, boring, pretty-looking, pointless, non-expositionary prattle. Her being in Rivendell is so pointless that she could hang around there for six months, and as far as the audience knows at that point, it wouldn't make any difference. When Elle arrives at Moria and is greeted by Gimli McHaggis, there is no sense of urgency in the negotiation. There's no, here's the contract, you'll be well paid, but we need to get this done fast, we are talking to other dwarf kingdoms. Or if they wanted to make it more interesting, El arrives to a Moria divided between two mutually hostile political factions. The king has control for now, but peace may not last long, and El's presence is putting everyone on edge. What's the elf doing here? 
is the king going to declare himself for one side or the other? And maybe this elf is here as an arms dealer or for the king to gauge the price of elven political support in the event of a civil war. Is this building contract nonsense just a cover story? That would be interesting. But no, L arrives and they have a rock-breaking contest. You know what would have been better than a rock-breaking contest? If both competitors got a bucket of paint and a wall, they paint the wall, and the painter of the wall that dries the fastest is the winner. In fact, make that a TV show, it would be a hell of a lot better than this turgid puke. And this rock-breaking contest just goes on and on and on. And after they finish, and as he is escorting L to be exiled, Gimli McHaggis has a wee bitch about how he's angry at Elle because Elle didn't attend his coming out party or something. Then they make up and now can something happen? Please? Oh look! Elle gets to spend the next several hours having dinner with Gimli McHaggis and first female dwarf of colour? Wow, this is even better than the rock breaking contest? The worst offenders for wasting the viewer's time with boring, pointless, irrelevant nonsense that has zero bearing on what passes for the plot are the potato hobbits. I was thinking about calling them Hickfoots or Trailer Trash Hobbits, but I didn't want to offend any members of the Hick or Trailer Trash communities by comparing them to these detestable little creatures. I fucking despise the potato hobbits. My feelings about this field vermin are best summed up by President Independence Day. Their whole civilization. After they've consumed every natural resource, they move on. Newcomb. The Snook, the bastards. Apart from Frodelma and Samiz, who I've already discussed, the show wastes time with Hobo Baggins prattling away to his wife about irrelevant potato hobbit shite. The black potato hobbit, who reminds me of Father Jack. I love my break! And who shall henceforth be referred to as Black Jack also gets quite a bit of screen time. There is a particularly weird and especially boring scene in which Black Jack explains the Potato Hobbit custom of leaving their own for shit if they get in trouble. They have that in common with Galadriel. Wait, no! We keep moving! Every time the Potato Hobbits show up on screen, I feel like I'm looking at a bunch of kindergartners run around at break time. And when the episode moves away from the Potato Hobbits, I honestly can barely remember what they did and have no idea why they were in the episode. I just know that they shouldn't have been. The only reason these filthy, dumb, muck savage gaggle of shit covered simpletons were crammed into this sloppy ruin of a failed adaptation is brand recognition. They were in the show to make it feel more like Lord of the Rings. If every single Potato Hobbit scene was egg-sized from Rings of Power, nothing would be lost in terms of story because these foul degenerates have nothing to do with it. The filthy Harfootses inhabit a show within a show. They're like itchy and scratchy in The Simpsons, a little comic relief miniseries within the show itself. But unlike itchy and scratchy, this variety of field rodent aren't funny. They're just tedious. The only vaguely interesting element of the Potato Hobbit show is the mystery box, the tramp that fell from the sky, presumably after being deported from Martha's Vineyard. But the problem with the mystery of the deported tramp is that once it has been solved, no one will care. It has no rewatchability. I could watch the Battle of Helm's Deep 100 times and I would still love it because it fucking crushes. But who, apart from a chronically depressed alcoholic who has given up on life to such a great extent that he can't even muster the willpower to change the channel, would voluntarily rewatch this? One whose memory we all carry are immersed in a light more intoxicating than any sensation in all of Middle-earth. When I was a child, <laughs> it was the only feeling I knew. Before I move on from the filthy Harfootses, I do want to comment on the show's use of Irish accents to give voice to these wretched beastlings. The implication is, of course, that the Irish accent is the natural choice for a mob of aimless, filthy, simple-minded tramps who maraud around the countryside, pillaging the surrounding nature of its edible resources, and when the area is barren and destroyed, moving on to the next target area. Is Amazon's implication here that the Irish are a kind of human locust? Or some disgusting variety of subhuman that must be burned within the squalid fields that we inhabit? Can you imagine the backlash if the Harfoots had, for example, accents that are typically attributed to black Americans? Hello, Glenn is in for three. We still short 900. I can go with that, no time. What? Motherfucker, where you get that kind of scratch? You don't think cheese know this here, gang? We selling dope and coke in Baltimore, nigga. Any of y'all ain't got that kind of money need be ashamed. You're still putting up more than your share with this. The way I look at it, we all gonna be more than paid once we own the connect, so. 
Shit, nigga, we was good when your uncle had it. You gonna stand there crying that back in the day shit. Jesus. There ain't no back in the day, nigga! Another problem with the presence of mystery boxes, there are several in this show, including a literal mystery box, is that it is a dated trope. The mystery box trope really took off when an entire TV show, Lost, was based around the dramatic device. This was eventually taken to such absurd lengths that the show itself turned into one giant mystery box. The trope reached its height in the 2010s, then began to die out as audiences tired of it. But the showrunners of Rings of Power were hatched in the caverns of Bad Robot, the hired assassin of Hollywood. If there is a franchise out there that you want dead, you call Bad Robot. And J.J. Abrams, the head assassin, loves mystery boxes. When his hatchlings, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, were sent out into the world to destroy any and all franchises they came across, the mystery box was a prominent weapon in their arsenal. The presence of mystery boxes in Rings of Power, along with the presence of Mary Sue in the form of Guy Ladriel, are elements of the show that make it appear dated. These elements cheapen the show by tropifying it. One of my favorite things in Rings of Power is the sixth form imitation Shakespeare dialogue. This is honestly the kind of shite I would expect from a 15 year old who has just finished reading Romeo and Juliet for his English class and now fancies himself a poet. The formula is simple, an analogy based on common nouns that are familiar to the group from which the expression came. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? Because a stone sees only downward. For centuries they have swept across crag and crevice, washing away the last remnants of our enemy, like a spring rain over the bones of a dead animal. One day, our true king will return and pry us right out from under your pointy boots. Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. I absolutely love this shit. Whenever one of these ridiculous lines show up, me and my wife burst out laughing because they stick out like a balrog in the shire. This isn't even hack level writing since the word hack implies experience, an indifferent professional who has long since run out of fucks to give and is just phoning it in now. Rings of Power dialogue is the kind of shit that gets laughed at in a writer's room. It truly is that bad. Let's now examine creative framework. This is perhaps the main reason Rings of Power fails so spectacularly. Lord of the Rings creative framework was based on a clear, simple, easy to understand mission statement. As filmmakers, as writers, we had no interest whatsoever in putting our junk, our baggage into these movies. We, we just thought we, we should take what Tolkien cared about clearly. We should take those and we should put them into the film. This should ultimately be Tolkien's film, it shouldn't be ours. That makes it very easy for everyone working on the project to understand the project as a whole and to do their jobs. The problem with Rings of Power's creative framework is that it doesn't have one. Instead, it has a vast set of rules and regulations that govern the project. These include, but we're certainly not limited to, a significant amount of screen time and dialogue must be given to women. Women must appear in roles of political and military leadership. Conversations between women must pass the Bechdel test, that is, when women speak to each other, they must not be discussing a man. The show must plagiarize the iconography of the Lord of the Rings movies. Men must be shown as feeble and inferior to women. At least 30% of roles must be given to actors considered minorities in the USA. Interracial couples must appear on screen. There must be important scenes that do not feature any men. A man cannot physically dominate a woman. A woman cannot lose a fight to a man. Men must be seen being put in their place by women. A woman cannot be seen learning anything important from a man. If necessary, female characters should be invented to ensure that male-only screen time be kept to an absolute minimum. There should be extensive analogy that serves as a commentary on perceived real-world problems. Oh, let it go, knife ears. The lot you lump us in with died off a thousand years ago. When are you people gonna let the past go? All of these rules and regulations suffocate the creative process. They make it impossible for the writers to establish an original, creative, dramatically satisfying narrative because they are constantly having to stop, check and revise their work to ensure that it adheres to the political vision of the regime. Perfectly good ideas will have to be scrapped because they go against establishment dogma and perfectly bad ideas will be inserted because they reflect political ideas and opinions that are fashionable among the ruling elites. 
Another major problem is the vague notion expressed by the showrunners that they want the show to be a reflection of the modern world. But that doesn't make any fucking sense. This isn't the modern world. This is Tolkien's world. It has magic, creatures of unremitting evil, wizards, immortal elves, dwarves that live in vast underground caverns, and half-man-sized people of human intelligence. You cannot crowbar in cherry-picked elements of the Western urbanized world of 2022 and expect to retain the magic of the literary creation and the trilogy. Everything has a cost, and the cost of multiracial casting in an ethnically homogenous part of Tolkien's world and of forcing women into leading positions in military and political affairs that they do not have in that world is that you lose some of that magic, you break canon, and you destroy the ethnography and hence the historical integrity of that world. You you also signal to everyone involved in the project that the source material is very open to interpretation and, if necessary, outright destruction. The Jackson trilogy is a work of genius because the director established a simple, clear, easy to follow framework for his cast and crew, that being, stick as close to the source material as possible. He was able to raise the standard of the cast and crew to a level of collective artistic genius. From that, you get Gollum's Odyssey, the passage through Moria, Sam and Frodo's ascent up Mount Doom, the Battle of Helm's Deep, the Ride of the Rohirrim, Christopher Lee's performance as Saruman, the Battle of Gondor, the music, the memes, the legions of fans comprising a force willing and capable of taking on one of the great corporate empires of our age, and winning. Let's move on now to in-world battle strategy. There may once have been a time when studios could have gotten away with nonsensical battle plans in their shows and movies, but that age is over. Today, there are simply far too many RTS and war sim gamers to let them get away with that. And while I don't claim to be a Napoleonic genius myself, I suspect that my own acumen in the area of defensive military tactics and strategy, gained from hundreds of hours proudly wasted on Total War and other RTS games, is at least superior to that of Stand in Legolas. Stand in decides to defend against Agar's army not in a purpose built tire fort with a single narrow path as the only approach, but rather to use the fort as a booby trap and instead to make a stand at the village. An entirely open village with no defensive barriers at all and no height advantage. In fact, the total opposite. The village is at a low point in a valley, surrounded by hills that look down on it. All Agar would have to do to win the battle is fire a few volleys of flaming arrows into this village because, you know, it's made of fucking wood. And that's it. Game over. The peasants lose. When stand-in Legolas pulled off his deception at the tower, I thought, very clever. It was a good position, but there's no way a bunch of untrained peasants could hold it. They would flag at first contact with the enemy. So you weaken your enemy, you make them hesitant to pursue you now that they're looking out for booby traps, and you flee into the hills with the village people. This man's actually a pretty good tactician. I, it, what? Are you fucking kidding me? You're going to use that to defend against that in this. When Legolas went to Helm's Deep with the ragtag force of condemned villagers and a handful of real soldiers, he knew that they couldn't possibly win. Even though it was the strongest fortress in Middle-earth, he knew that they didn't stand an nth chance in Mount Doom against Saruman's army. And that... Not the Dagathire. Because Legolas isn't a complete moron. On the contrary, he's an experienced warrior. He is able to assess the military situation and make an accurate prediction based on basic on-the-ground intelligence. But stand in Legolas decides that his band of old men, women, mothers with babies and kids, all of them half-starved and terrified, can defend an open village that will light up faster than Peregrine took in an Amsterdam cafe if Agar decides to toss a few torches into it. But that's all right because Standin has a plan. He's going to give the peasant defenders a stirring speech, thus assuring victory. Soon the sun will set. Do your part. And I swear to you, you shall see it rise again. I don't know what the elf equivalent of West Point is, but clearly Standin Legolas wasn't paying attention during the don't defend an open village with militarily illiterate peasants against an advancing army of experienced, well-armed and motivated orcs module of the course. By the way, I applaud Agar's use of the use up the Irish tactic in his conquest of the village. Use up the Irish. The dead cause nothing. Now we move on to plot holes and Rings of Power has a lot of them. How many? 
10,000 strong at least. Galadriel looks for Sauron for hundreds of years, but she fails to locate the orcs in the Southlands during this time. The notion that she would carry out a pursuit of someone personally for hundreds of years is absurd. That's not how hunting fugitives works. Galadriel was a woman with political and economic power. She could have put a bounty on Sauron and, as the Germans did with the Jews, offered a small bounty for every orc head brought to her. In Holland during World War II, the Germans paid five guilders, about a week's pay for a labourer, for every Jew Dutch bounty hunters brought in. This bounty was raised to 40 guilders toward the end of the war. If Galadriel did something similar, raising the bounty as the orc numbers diminished, she could have hundreds of bounty hunters carrying out her search across the length and breadth of Middle-earth for free. She could also use the most skilled bounty hunters to help her set up a spy network, which would increase her political power while also allowing her to search for Sauron in many places at once. But instead, she runs around Middle-earth in circles for a couple of hundred years because the writers are inexperienced, unimaginative morons. How did Galadriel know that the wall in the cave fortress was a fake? Why did the elves not see the giant fucking hole in the ground next to the utterly butchered forest in the Southlands? I guess their elf eyes got distracted by the local talent. What do your elf eyes see? You're such a fucking hoe. I love it. Why doesn't Gyladriel take her armor off after the battle at Sword Hilt Village? Battle armor is really heavy. How did Gyladriel and the Numenorians know that they needed to go to Sword Hilt Village? How did they get there so fast? Why did the Numenorians only send 500 men? That's a pathetically small force. It's large enough to be expensive and politically unpopular, but too small to achieve any significant military or political goals. How did the Numenorians get to the Southlands so quickly? Numenor is further away from the Southlands than the Shire. Why did Galadriel jump into the sea when she was approaching Valinor? What exactly was her plan? The Great Sea is about the size of the Atlantic Ocean and she's already close to Valinor. Was she going to swim the 3,000 miles all the way back to Middle-earth? I guess she must have known that the riders would have her rescued by a random vessel. How convenient it was that Galadriel's army arrived at Sword Hilt Village just at the very moment they were needed? Why was the army charging at full speed toward the village? This would suggest that they knew what was happening, but how? They couldn't have sent a scout ahead that fast, and the peasants had no horses to carry a rider out to call for help. Why doesn't Stand in Legolas have a basic knowledge of military tactics? He's been a professional soldier for at least eight decades. Why didn't the orcs send skirmishers or scouts to the tower before they attacked? Given their extreme caution up to this point, it's natural to assume that they would. Why would the Numenorean queen order that Galadriel hang around for a few days after she arrives in Numenor? Her being in Numenor is politically unpopular for the queen and Galadriel immediately expresses her wish to leave. Give her a boat and let her fuck off. Win-win. Galadriel is 4,000 years old. Why does she behave like a 14-year-old girl who's had her smartphone taken away? The Elven King does a fairly good job of existing, but not much else. What exactly is his function? The survivors of a village destroyed by the orcs manage to almost cross the Great Sea, but none of them make it to an elf outpost to alert the elves of the orc attacks. Why does Village Wench's son leave the village after the explosion without looking for his mother? Galadriel is supposed to be the commander of this pissant invasion force, yet she just leaves her soldiers for shit after the volcano erupts. In Potato Hobbit society, being at the back of the caravan is considered a virtual death sentence. This wouldn't work. It would lead to violent arguments, revenge killings, and bribery, which would cause political intrigue and infighting, and eventually civil war. No tribe as small and as filthy as the filthy Harfords could remain a coherent social social unit while engaging in the practice of using whoever happens to be unpopular around migration time as a human shield for everyone else. Also, given their small numbers, such a practice would inevitably lead to their eventual extinction, especially given the fact that they don't seem to have a problem with condemning young, healthy breeding females to the back of the caravan. Why did the volcano erupt when water was channeled into it? That's not how volcanoes work. How did anyone in the vicinity of a volcanic eruption survive? Any major volcanic eruption is significantly more powerful than the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. I need to talk now about the show's ethnography because it makes absolutely no sense at all. 
Frodelma is whiter than the White City, yet her mother is a mixed-race half-black woman. The ethnography of the Potato Hobbits makes no sense. How can a numerically insignificant race of people that have existed in total isolation for hundreds, if not thousands of years, be racially diverse? How can a man as dark-skinned as Black Jack be in the same small tribe as Frodelma and Samiz, or Hobo Baggins? Their ancestors would long ago have bred the tribe into an ethnically homogenous group with almost no distinguishing racial features, and there would be almost no difference at all between the group members' skin color. How is this even possible? But of course, we all know the answer to that. Progression. The same is true of the Numenorians. They are an island people. They have owned the island for about a thousand years. I can understand the odd foreigner walking around the port. They do a lot of trading after all. But the Numenorians themselves would, again, long since have racially assimilated, but again, this is not the case because... Progression. In Lord of the Rings, the ethnography made sense. The people of Middle-earth were white because they consisted of ethnically homogenous peoples based on Europeans who lived there for thousands of years. The dark-skinned people who show up in Return of the King on elephants are dark-skinned because they are mercenaries from outside of Middle-earth that Sauron has hired for his army. So the racial diversity on display in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields made ethnographic sense. The racial diversity in Rings of Power makes no sense. It's just lazy lazy box ticking with no attempt made to explain it. Amazon's answer to anyone who asks questions about why Middle Earth is suddenly very racially diverse is racist. To anyone who would like Amazon to explain the ethnographic history of this updated version of Middle Earth, they respond racist. Want to know why there is just a random black dwarfette living among a people who have been, again, largely isolated from the world for hundreds of years, if not longer? Racist. If Amazon wanted to include non-European people in their show, they should have at least made an effort to have their presence make historical, demographic, and biological sense. In Lord of the Rings, it does. In Rings of Power, it doesn't. Ethnography is an important part of world building, and when world building is determined not by what makes sense within that world, but rather by current year political fashions, that world's fourth wall is torn down. The sovereignty of that world to exist according to its own internal history and logic is violated by ideologues in our world of the perpetual current year. But according to Hollywood, you're not allowed ever to escape current year. Even in fantasy, when you watch a TV show about a fantasy world at the medieval stage of political development, you can't be allowed to see what that world would realistically look like. What you really need to see is a reflection of the modern world as woke assholes see fit to depict it. Now we have to address the elephant in the room, Galadriel. Rings of Power has, with the character who bears the name Galadriel, given us one of the most detestable villains in the history of television. She stands as a testament to the supreme incompetence of the writers and has become the anti-icon of this show. She was intended by the writers to be a hero admired by all for her skill, bravery, and determination. She turned out an insufferable Mary Sue whose actions and behavior make no sense and who could quite easily be classified as clinically psychotic. Galadriel encapsulates everything that is wrong with this show. Her dismissal of the opinions and advice of all around her reflects the arrogance of the showrunners who tossed Tolkien's lore into the trash because they felt they could do better. She is the feminist scourge that has cursed every man in this show with incompetence and cowardice, apart, of course, from Sauron the Great. Galadriel is Mary Sue, a now very tired trope the showrunners carried with them when they were sent out from the caverns of Bad Robot into the realm of man. Galadriel is the subversion of Tolkien. The true Galadriel, as superbly depicted by Kate Blanchett, is gone. In her place is a childless spinster driven by a psychopathic desire for blood vengeance, and nothing else. Galadriel is the meandering, aimless plot, running and swimming around Middle-earth like a headless chicken, seeking a destination that she never reaches. Galadriel is, like this show, really fucking boring. The Lord of the Rings is one of the most exciting, fun, and just plain awesome movie trilogies of all time. The Rings of Power is, well, The Rings of Power. Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget to reimagine the like button as a reflection of downtown LA.